almost everyone in the room has some form of client or customer. And also everyone in the room sells likely some form of product or service, whether it's directly to an external client or customer or internally to, uh, to clients that we serve internally. Um, strikingly, you know, both of you have told me before that uh, uh, more than selling a product or an experience or, or, a, uh, or a service, you both feel like your companies sell an experience. And so I figured I'd start by asking this question. I mean, what is the difference between selling a product or service and selling an experience? So I think that there's been this really interesting trend over the last 10 to 15 years in our economy. And that is that the only thing we're all starved for is time. Hmm. Regardless of how much money people make, you find that at the end of the year bonus season, you get that bonus check and you immediately want to book a vacation. And that life is really about a collection of memory creating experiences. All that we really care about in our lives are those moments that we can look back on and look forward to. So, so much of Rent the Runway and the mission of the company is to deliver Cinderella experiences to women. And we think that you know, empowering women to feel their most beautiful and their most self-confident before a special occasion is actually going to drive our business because no one comes to us just because you can rent for 90% off. They're coming to us because they feel better about themselves when they've rented the runway and therefore they want to repeat the behavior. So I think the experience is about thinking what is this emotional experience from the time someone thinks, you know, I have an occasion to how they shop your site, how they receive your inventory, how do they return your inventory, that everything should feel memorable because that's what's really going to drive loyalty for us. Hmm. Yeah, I think sort of what drove us to create Warby Parker was thinking about the process of buying glasses. And for us, it was going into an optical store in which there were 700 to 1,000 different options, 95% of which sucked. And the person serving us uh, didn't know sort of who we were and what we were looking for. And then, you know, once we would pick out a particular frame, then we were constantly upsold on the lenses, the coding, and there was this crazy amount of information asymmetry. Uh, and then you walk out really feeling terrible, like literally someone punched you in the stomach because you just spent $500 for something that has technology that's 700 years old, you know, versus like an iPhone. Um, so we thought, what if we could rethink this experience and we could uh, make glasses that reflect someone's personality and make that purchase process easy and simple and provide confidence to folks to, to buy those glasses, a small curated collection. Um, and uh, we're seeing that it, it is making people happier. And when we measure our customer satisfaction, uh, we find that our scores through Net Promoter Score are higher than any other score we've ever seen. It's about 88, uh, where Apple and Zappos are 78 and 82, respectively. Um, so we think that that's a leading indicator versus revenue, which is more of a lagging indicator, and think that that will bring us success in the long run. Actually, the co-founder of Zappos, who um, has really been a mentor to myself and my co-founder, he describes companies as a pyramid. And he thinks that at the bottom of the pyramid, people sell commodities. And at the top of the pyramid, you sell dreams. And when you sell a dream, you're able to command a higher price. So for example, if you go on Zappos.com, every single pair of shoes on Zappos.com is more expensive than a pair of shoes on shoebuy.com or lots of others of their competitors. But you are paying for the culture of Zappos, the customer service, knowing that you can buy 10 pairs and return nine of them and everything being OK. I think that one interesting corollary that we saw late, earlier this year is what happened with Netflix, that the executives at Netflix didn't understand that people viewed Netflix as being an experience. It was part of someone's leisure time. And when they just went and changed the brand and changed the price point, there was national you know, riots, <laughs> which I don't think that you know, they anticipated. And they have such an amazing management team. But they had built such a strong, powerful brand that was based around memory creation. People went to them to relax and have a great time when they went home. And therefore, the resistance to change is going to be higher. 
it seems like they didn't know then that they were selling an experience. I mean, yeah. Maybe if you ask someone at Netflix, they're like, oh, we rent movies, you know, product commoditized. How do you, um, for, as a culture, I mean, you're building teams. Now both of you have large teams based in New York. How do you make sure people know what it is that they are selling? From my, whether it's a hiring or a training standpoint all the way through to the delivering of the service. Yeah, I, I think the first thing is just uh, sort of on, onboarding people, making sure that you're also selecting the right people. We have sort of two sayings. Uh, one is hire slow, fire fast. And the other is uh, better to have a hole than an a-hole. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> It's, it's our interview process is about 75% dedicated to personality and fit. And as much as we're trying to evaluate the, the people coming in, if this is going to be a place for them to thrive, we try and give them a sense of what our office is like and what are the people are like so that way they can make an informed decision. Uh, but it comes from having the right people. And our interview process, uh, we think about questions that are going to help us evaluate whether that person is aligned with our core values, which we have articulated, which is you know, in our pantry, where everybody goes probably 10 times a day. Um, so we really try to infuse our core values into everything that we do. Um, one of the things that we've also done is we have a showroom in our office down in Soho where people can come in, um, try on the glasses, and then they actually have to order the glasses through an iMac, through our sort of typical checkout process that they would do at home. Uh, but it allows it to be a learning lab and for us to see sort of how our customers you know, typically shop and are interacting with our website. But it's also a learning lab for our employees. And everybody that comes into Warby Parker, they actually have to go through customer experience training and sort of go through the same training as somebody that is answering the phones or responding to emails. And then they also have to spend time in that showroom uh, interacting face to face with customers. We do something very similar. We have a team at Rent the Runway called Customer Insights, which actually we've taken the idea of customer service and tried to turn it on its head because we think that the way that we transform our business is by gaining insights from our customers. And who's talking to customers all day long? It's the women who are on the phones, on email, on chat. So we've basically built our customer insights team as our internal strategy group. We've gone to all of the top Ivy League schools in the country and kind of simulated an investment banking analyst program, but we've basically told the most talented young people that they are going to work in customer service for two years. But the purpose of their job is going to be to glean insights on how we should change our product, our website, our business model, um, you know, our merchandise, and actually make our experience better. The other thing we do is very similar. When someone is onboarded into Rent the Runway, in their first week, they spend one full day with our customer insights team, answering the phones, talking to customers, just no matter who they are. So we put the male engineer who doesn't know how to style a woman in dresses, we make him listen to every phone conversation and do those exact same actions. We also take everyone and we make them um, spend a day in our operations, in our warehouse, which is in New Jersey, and people are pickpacking and shipping orders and understanding that we are in the business of making women feel amazing about themselves. And that is really happening from two teams, customer insights and ops. So I think that it really hones the entire spirit of the company that if there's ever a problem, we're going to go and kind of be all hands on deck, on the phones. I spend one day a month on customer insights myself, talking on the phones, and the entire week between Christmas and New Year's, which is our busiest week of the year, our whole company turns into either customer service operations team. And we're no longer at a point where we need to do that. In year one of our business, we really did it because we had to. Now we do it because it re-energizes the entire company around these Cinderella moments that we're delivering to our customers. And how do you know when uh, what the customers want or the client, you know, what sort of they're dictating to change in the experience? When to, you know, the, that saying that customers don't necessarily know what, you know, they, what is it? They, they, can, they know what they want, but they don't know what they need. I mean, are there times, I mean, how do you then filter, you know, some of the stuff that you're hearing, some of the stuff from the customer insights team? I mean, what's the sort of process to decide when you're actually going to make that change and not? I think you start to hear things often. Yeah. You know, there aren't that many things that people do communicate to you through these channels. You start to hear the same thing over and over again. You can either let your business 
stay that way or you can kind of innovate and change it. And I think that both of our businesses are based around the humility that this is a, num a nimble, growing, changing thing. We are still a startup, and we're, we've only scratched the surface of what the company can become. So if we're not open ears really listening to feedback, we're never going to get to a place where we're able to transform the retail industry. Yeah, and, and I think being customer-centric doesn't necessarily mean being everything to everybody. Um, it's really understanding uh, who your customer is and doing the best to serve them, but it also could be saying, you know what, we're, we're not going to serve these other folks just yet because we can't do it particularly well. So an example is when we launched, um, we weren't providing prescription sunglasses, and that's just because we you know, weren't ready to do that yet. We just launched that two weeks ago. Uh, we don't offer progressives or bifocals. Um, and you know, even though we're getting requests every day about it, um, we don't feel like we can provide the best experience for it. And, and it requires a, a different aspect of fitting, which we're working on, uh, but we'll launch that later. And, and I think one of the themes that you're hearing here is just being detail-oriented, being deliberate, being focused. Um, and using data. So uh, when people are calling in with certain questions or tweeting about something, you know, tracking what are the, the, the biggest things and prioritizing how we're going to focus on it um, by you know, the scale of which it impacts our customer base. So I know both of you view the customers you serve as a community. And uh, so I guess one question is, I mean, we're here at the 99% conference. It's all about execution. Your teams have tons of things they want to, you want to do and ways you want to build your business. How does your community help you execute? Well, our community, I think, is the best marketing engine that we have. We have uh, tens of thousands of photos now up on our website called Rent the Runway Moments, where women, without any incentive, after their Rent the Runway experience, because they felt so self-confident, so beautiful, they come back and they kind of share that Cinderella experience with others. And they talk about you know, the event they went to and that their husband was just coming back from Iraq and how she felt when she kind of was ready in this amazing outfit or her prom or her wedding. And it's amazing because I think that sharing the authenticity of what our experience actually is, is the real um, glue that gets someone to try this new customer behavior. No one is trying because I'm giving someone a discount. In fact, in the past, we've offered um, someone like $50 off their first offer, their first order, or even a free order, and that doesn't move the needle as much as um, sharing these kind of Cinderella moments. So the community markets for us, and we still receive about 60% of all of our member acquisition through referrals and kind of through other women, which is amazing, two and a half years into our company. Mm. I also think that they keep us honest because whenever someone has a negative rent the runway experience, it's around an event that actually is important to them. You're not renting because it's like a Tuesday and you're going to work. You're renting because you have a date or you have a party, something that's meaningful to you. And therefore, when we mess up, it is all over Facebook, all over Twitter, like, <laughs> you know, and the whole world can see it. And I think how honestly we react to those situations, how honestly we apologize. I mean, we do mess up. And I think that it's really refreshing to the customer when the customer hears, you know, that's our mistake. It's our bad. We're going to accept responsibility. How can we make this better for you? Too often, companies try to make excuses. And I think that people are smarter than that. And I would say the same thing probably goes for clients. I mean, you know, if, even if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. making an excuse versus sort of the, you know, the honesty and the the relationship that's built as a result of it. Yeah, I think transparency and openness wins. And when you look at all these studies on how humans interact and how they build trust, a lot of it has to do with being vulnerable and, and being open. 
Um, so that's something that we've been from, from day one. We had our Facebook wall, well, when there was the wall, right, instead of the timeline, um, always open and people could post on it. And we saw something magical start to happen where people would post photos of themselves wearing the glasses. And we have this home try-on program where you select five frames, we ship it to you free of cost, and you have five days to try it on at home. And people would uh, post photos of themselves wearing the five frames asking for feedback. And the whole entire community would provide you know, feedback on which frame to, to purchase. Um, you can only do that if you have that open, and you can only engender trust if uh, you're also not censoring you know, the, those posts. So it's something, you know, we're out there, warts and all. Um, I think what, you'll, what you're increasingly seeing is with the internet, you can't hide any longer. Right? You make a mistake, you do something wrong, it's going to get out there. Um, and if you're not being proactive about it, uh, then you're going to get crushed. And I mean, you're, well, you both have important brands or great brands to protect. I mean, when you see these Rent the Runway moments going up and some of them are horrible pictures, um, I mean, is, it, is any of this, what's the response that you sort of push your team to take to the, the blemishes, the warts that you're proposing? Or do we just leave them out there or do we, and how do we engage with them as companies and you know, anyone of us? Yeah, you know, every so often I'll, <laughs> I'll see somebody, it's like, wow, those glasses do not look very good on you, but um, <laughs> they have a very big smile on their face. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's, that's our customer. And uh, we've been able to drive over 50% of our traffic and sales through refer referrals without any incentives for them to do that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of that relationship being built. Uh, and part of that is this idea of accessibility um, and not being one of those fashion brands that says, oh, you know, you're know, you not pretty enough to wear our, our apparel or accessories, which is the antithesis of who we are. You know, we'll control our brand based on what we put out ourselves. But I think the general public is completely fine with you know seeing you know, images produced by other people that might not be of the same standard as what we would put out there ourselves. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Our whole mission is to democratize luxury and give everyone access to those kind of red carpet moments and everyone feel deserving that they can kind of go out and wear that amazing dress and amazing pair of accessories before a moment that's important to them. So I love seeing women of all different, you know, shapes and sizes and, you know, feeling confident and posting those photos because that's authentic to who we are. Like, this isn't a brand about outfitting the Vogue girl. The Vogue girls have their, their clothes and their free kind of amazing designer dresses anyway. This is about the 99% of the population that... <laughs> <laughs> nice that, plug, nice plug. Um, really wants something aspirational and gets high value, derives high value from that. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, we, we, so, we so often see our customers and clients in a transactional way. And, you know, the idea that both of you have tried to reward people for uh, putting stuff up and that was not effect, as effective as just not rewarding them. Really just, I mean, having it, and I guess the price you pay is the transparency. Is whatever people put up, they, they, they can put up, and, and, but net-net, that that's a positive. Uh, so has the, I mean, I'm sure, the social web has played a huge role in, in you selling not a product and service, but an experience. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the pluses and perils you know, of, uh, of, of having such a, such a focus on all the, all the social web things you know, coming up every day now that I'm sure you're using in interesting ways. And so one thing that was interesting is uh, we saw Pinterest, traffic from Pinterest quadruple over the past four months. Um, with higher conversion rates than that of Twitter or Facebook. Um, so uh, as there are more and more of these social networks to leverage, uh, it's always interesting to see uh, where people's intent to purchase is uh, along those networks and what is it that they're sharing. Um, we put together this annual report uh, that was an infographic that didn't really, wasn't a very traditional uh, financial report in that it didn't really have our financials, but it had a bunch of operating <laughs> metrics uh, on like the busiest 
uh, call volume times during the day, um, or sales, or the bagels that we eat you know, on our Wednesday morning team meetings, or the beer types that we drink at during happy hour, um, or the 10 uh, most commonly misspelled keyword searches. And I think people like taking a look under the, under the hood, and they don't get that access necessarily at other companies. And that led to a ton of virality that resulted in our three highest consecutive days of sales. Hmm. Um, so when we're doing things, we're always thinking a, a, about them in four ways. You know, is it beautifully designed? Um, is it authentic? Um, is there a compelling story and narrative behind it? And is it unexpected? And we feel that by sort of looking at that framework, we'll create reasons for people to talk about us because everyone's looking for that like tidbit to you know spout off during at the dinner table. Right. We actually have implemented something within the company called a wow budget. So we give our employees the ability to, at their own discretion, wow customers in whatever ways they feel most appropriate. And first of all, this is empowering to employees to say, you know, you have this much money you can spend over the course of the year, and we don't care if you spend all of it on one person or you divide it into thousands of people. But one of the things that we found is so incredible about Rent the Runway is what also happens offline. So because you're renting the runway for a special occasion, to give you a conversation piece at that party, at that wedding, to talk about. So at different points during the year, we will literally surprise our customers with free outfits for the weekend, where we'll send them $2,000 worth of product and just be like, make a night of it, have fun. And those kinds of experiences, which are unexpected and about delighting people just because, really create this loyalty and affinity to the brand that nothing else can truly do. So I think that our own employees are the ones who are the most creative about thinking through what should those wow experiences be. And I love that as our team gets bigger and bigger, our diversity of ideas does as well. And I think that we just are continuously upping the ante on creativity of how to you know, infuse even more Cinderella moments into these customer experiences. How about... Uh for those of us that work inside companies with internal clients, you know, and, 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 uh, and we all want to influence the people around us if we're trying to change things within our own businesses, I don't know, any thoughts on how this sort of notion of selling an experience can be leveraged in that sort of mode? Yeah, I think it goes back to really understanding that customer, that client, and what are their needs, um, and what is the process behind which they make a decision. So a parallel to buying glasses, uh, we found that first and foremost, people care about how they look on their face. Second, price. Third, sort of quality and service. And then fourth, you know, social mission, if, if there is one tied to the eyewear brand. So when you look at the hierarchy of messages that we're putting out there to the public, it leads with fashion, then price, then quality and service, and then our social mission, which is really robust and motivates us every day. But we recognize that that's not going to be the number one feature that drives someone to actually buy a pair of glasses from us. Um, I think people need to be thinking about that same sort of hierarchy of needs through their internal clients. Um, as well, and what is going to make their life easier, right? If they need to get approval for something from somebody else, how do you equip them with the tools uh, that they can easily show to a superior to get the job approved and moving forward? Um, how, throughout the process, do you continue to instill confidence that this is the right decision and the right move? You know, if you think about Apple, um, their, their whole marketing strategy, product development, is all about inspiring confidence at every step of the way. You go on the website, and it's like, oh, wow, you know, this is the best for X, Y, and Z reasons. When I get that box and I open it, um, and I sort of take out that iPhone, you know, it's not jammed in there and difficult to get out. Um, it doesn't immediately fall out. It actually just slides over, um, just at that right speed. Um, and it's something that you might not think subconsciously, um, or you are thinking subconsciously, but it gives you confidence that, wow, this is going to be a good product. 
And I can tell you from speaking to folks at Apple, that was very, very deliberate. So just think about um, all those sort of steps that you're going to be taking to instill confidence and make your clients or your coworkers' lives easier. I think to break it down even simpler than that, like people don't read. People don't actually listen. So unless you're <laughs> communicating your message as quickly and succinctly as possible, it's not going to reach whoever the customer is. And it is, it's become even more clear to me after starting Rent the Runway that people don't read and people don't <laughs> listen because we put in like 36 point font everywhere on our website things like, you get the second size for free. And we surveyed all of our active members and we're like, how many of you know that you get the second size for free? And this is on every single page of our whole website. And they're like, 50% no. Like, so I think that in every communication and when I think about how do you run a meeting, how do you actively participate in a meeting, those people who speak less, but when they open their mouths, they say the one or two bullet points super effectively and really clearly with confidence. Like that's what I wish every meeting was because that's how you convert those only 5.5 hours of productive time into hopefully more of that. And Scott obviously could be the one to tell us how to get from 5.5 to nine. I don't know, <laughs> kind of a player coach issue here. Um, uh, so let's, I mean, one last question is just around, um, around brands, you know, and we all have a personal brand here. Many of us who are freelancers, that is our business brand. Others of us manage larger brands um, for teams and companies. Uh, and it seems like you both are very focused on transparency, the annual report, sharing everything down to what type of bagels you eat, or uh, honesty when something screws up and you have to sort of disclaim it and just, and, and just own it. How do you think that that helps build trust? You know, what can we learn from, you know, what you guys have learned? and trust with brands. Yeah. I think that people define themselves as not just how they act, but the brands and other people that they choose to associate with. So if someone t chooses to buy your product or engage in your service, they're actually saying something about themselves. And I don't think that anyone wants to associate with you know, fakeness or dishonesty or you know, they're very clear things and, um, that you can do to build that trust. Um, we saw this actually over this past Cyber Monday and kind of the week after that with a company called Bonobos.com, which is another startup in New York. They sell men's apparel online. And on Cyber Monday, their site crashed. And Actually, for the next five or six days after that, the site was down as well. And the CEO of that company, Andy Dunn, I think was so forthright and so honest with not just his community of Bonobos Nation, their fans, but also the employees at the company. He was there till 3, 3 a.m. answering customer service calls, like brought, blogging about this, sharing what was going on on Twitter and on Facebook. And in a moment where you know, it was likely a huge percentage of their annual sales. He turned that opportunity that week into something that furthered connection with the brand and furthered loyalty to the company. So I think that even negative situations, if they're treated with honesty and authenticity, can turn into positive opportunities to create loyalty for a brand. Yeah, I think when the waters are a little choppy, that's a great opportunity to show that you're a steady captain, right? And when there are um, challenges uh, or a customer has a bad experience, that's an opportunity for us to sort of jump in and solve the problem and, and save the day. And then we find that those customers are sort of the most loyal and the most excited to, to chat about us. Um, I think what brands do, there's sort of two things. One is that People build relationships with brands, um, and uh, brands also uh, allow people to understand what they can expect, and that there's going to be continuity and a s consistency and a certain level of quality. So, as as everyone thinks about developing their own personal brand, you know, what does that stand for? What are you going to deliver without fail every time? 
you know, um, and it doesn't always need to be the end product, right? It's like you're going to be the most responsive freelan free freelancer in the world, and it means whenever someone emails me, I'm going to get back to them within this time frame, and I'm dependable. You know, what are those key brand attributes that you're going to live and die by? It's also interesting because when you track um, loyalty rates, we find that when someone rents the runway somewhere between three or four times, they become, uh, their loyalty goes from this curve to soaring. So the probability that they'll rent 100 times after that is like 99% again. Um, so what we find is like it's about the consistency of that experience. No one builds loyalty or affinity the first time they interact with a product or a service or the first conversation. You don't build a lifelong relationship with someone after you meet them for the first time. It's all about building that relationship slowly and authentically over time. So I think each brand likely has their kind of number of times you need to get it right before someone actually trusts you or believes in your product and service. So we think about what needs to happen over those first three to four Rent the Runway experiences that someone can teach themselves that we are a company that can kind of be with them for every special occasion in their life. And that's very, I think it's a very natural, intuitive thing in the same way you build friendships over time or you build kind of relationships with your coworkers. I think it's the exact same thing for brands. And I think it's a great point I because mean, all of us do have a product or service that we create, that we share. And, uh, and thinking about that as an experience uh, and thinking of ourselves as a brand and building those relationships with the people that we serve is, uh, is a major part of the journey. Yeah, so, it's, it's not first impression, it's the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth that right. are probably more important. And knowing, getting people to know what to expect. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. <laughs>